The rainy season began in early summer, and June had been no exception. It did not surprise the man when he discovered rainwater dripping from his dining room ceiling. Shrugging it off, he placed a tall pot beneath the leak and expected it to stop on its own. However, it continued to rain, and before he knew it, the pot would threaten to overflow. He had to dump the water out first thing in the morning and straight after he returned home from work. Eventually, he began to notice damage at the source of the leak. The white ceiling had discolored, turning a dull shade of brown. He checked the weather and realized that it would continue to rain sporadically over the next 10 days. The man was worried about the ceiling mildewing and becoming an expensive repair, so he called a local handyman. Unfortunately, the man could not sign to have the repairs done. Only his landlord could. It was a frustrating policy. The man called his landlord, but could not reach him. He left him a few voicemails, detailing how the damage was becoming progressively worse. The man was clueless as to why his landlord would not return his calls. They usually kept in touch, speaking at least twice a month. Finally, he reasoned that he would not be held accountable for any damages sustained. One night, the man was startled awake by a massive thump. He quickly turned on his bedside lamp and just vaguely he could see an overturned table and a large shape laying across it. He sprinted out of his apartment and called the police, gagging at the smell. The man sat in the police station with a blanket wrapped around his shoulders and a coffee mug resting in his hands. He did know one thing. There had been a dead body in his ceiling, and the water had saturated it so badly that it caved under the weight. So far, the body was unidentifiable due to the rainwater and was being autopsied. While the man waited, he called his landlord and finally reached him, panicking as he explained the situation. His landlord was just as alarmed, and the man pleaded for him to come to the station while he made his statement. The man then paused as a detective crossed over to him, and he lowered his phone, wondering if the body had been identified. His blood ran immediately cold, and he shook his head with terror. The body belonged to Richard Thompson, his landlord, and he had died over a year ago. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Just wanted to welcome you all aboard our flight today and give a special thank you to our High Flies reward members who are earning valuable points on today's 2 hour and 14 minute flight to Los Angeles. We are expecting a bit of rough air over the mountains past Denver, but other than that we've got clear skies and should have a smooth ride. Please remember to remain seated with your seatbelt fastened when the seatbelt sign is on and listen to our wonderful flight crew. Now we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy our ride out to LA. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking again. We have reached our cruising altitude of 32,000 feet and I've turned the seatbelt sign off. Please feel free to get up and move about the cabin. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain once again. 
I wanted to call out a very special passenger on our flight today. Greg is seated in 23A and he is a veteran. Let's all take a second and thank Greg for his service with a round of applause. Yes, remember this is all for you Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to address Greg one more time here. He is just such a special guy. A veteran, a father, a husband, an adulterer. You see, my wife thinks Greg is very special too. I've seen the text between the two of them. Greg spends a lot of time at my house when I'm away for work. Isn't that right, Greg? Ladies and gentlemen, if you have just heard a bit of a <clears throat> ruckus from the cockpit up here, it's nothing to be concerned about. The co-pilot was worried that I'm a little too upset to be flying right now, and I did need to strangle him. But don't worry, I can fly the plane all by myself. Unlike Greg? Greg's a personal trainer at the gym. How very bloody special you are, Greg! Ladies and gentlemen, if you've noticed, we've started to um, descend a bit rapidly here. I just wanted to give Greg a fun ride, like he did to my wife. Are you enjoying the ride, Greg? I know she did. I read every single message, Greg. You're hung like a horse. My tiny shriveled cock could never compare. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, those are the mountains we are rapidly approaching. Did you know Greg always gets my wife to the mountain top? <laughs> Apparently, I never did. But she doesn't have to fake her orgasms with Greg. Greg, special, bloody Greg. Well, Greg, I thought you might want to help all these people reach the mountain top as well. It's because of you that I'm taking us all there. Well, it would be more of the mountainside, really. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as we descend lower, you might get cell service back briefly before impact. I'd recommend you call your loved ones. Greg, unfortunately, I killed my wife before I got on the plane, so she won't answer this time. <laughs> Our story begins with a nine-year-old boy named Tommy who had been waiting nine months for his older brother Jacob's return. Jacob, who was 15 years old, was returning from military school 
and young Tommy was never more content to see someone. Mind you, that Jacob wasn't sent to the school for some juvenile penalty. Matter of fact, he was very loving and even more so protective of young Tom. You see, Tom's birthday was just the day before Jacob's return, so imagine his surprise with the newest video game from his favorite franchise coming out. Now Tom wanted to show his friends his new game, and so he invited Jacob to his upcoming sleepover with kids from school, to which Jacob happily obliged. That weekend, Tom directed Jacob to the house of Matthew, his best friend, where they were greeted by Paul, Jessica, and her little sister Lily. After showing his friends the game Jacob had gotten him, Tom put the disc in Matthew's console and they all took turns playing it. In the middle of their session, they got an unexpected knock at the door. A puzzled Tom got up and volunteered to see who it was, wondering who had come so late. When Tom opened the front door, he found the visitor to be Eliza. Now, Eliza was another friend of Tom's. However, whenever he thought of Eliza, he reluctantly thought of some events that happened last school year. At school, Eliza had been, let's say, too unnervingly hyper to be around, so Tom, Jessica, and Lily had ditched her and she grew to hate them for the rest of the year. Little Lily only went along with it because Jessica had done so, and they had done it for some fairly immature reasons. Tom never said it out loud, but he was rather annoyed with Eliza always calling him Tommy instead of his birth name, something he was very confident about. On the last day of school, they made their apologies, and though she sometimes got annoyed with the three of them, Eliza was once again known as a friend to Tom. Although she did so reluctantly, Eliza comforted Tom whenever he had bad dreams and told her about them. Eliza never was one for surprises, which is why Tom was a bit taken aback by her suddenly showing up to the sleepover. She hadn't gotten an invite. Yet when he greeted her, she acted as if such an invite had been provided to her. Despite this foreign occurrence, Tom was rather polite with her, and he did what he thought was right, and so invited her in. Tom's other friends were just as puzzled to see Eliza. Matthew even shot a look of passive confusion towards Tom for letting Eliza in uninvited. Tom and the other boys treated her normally, and Eliza herself acted normal. But it was a few hours later when Tom started to notice Eliza behaving rather… odd. She suddenly stood there, as if frozen in time, appearing on edge, as if she would suddenly lash out at any given second. Although she never did. The other boys were too busy trying to playfully tackle Jacob, while Jessica was getting it all on film before slightly lowering the video camera, noticing Eliza's appearance as well. Jacob had been noticing it too, but his wonders were cut off shortly by yet another impact by one of the boys. Hours later, after everyone's energy had been burned out, Paul got the idea to play a game of Kiss, Mary, Kill. Jacob rather awkwardly opted out, being much older than the rest and even offered to move to another room. Everyone took their turn, occasionally giggling at one another's choices. At last, Eliza took her turn and concluded with her response to kill. I would kill Jacob so he couldn't keep Tom from me. The children smiled mockingly at Tom and Eliza in their circle on the floor, but things took a nasty turn when Eliza continued. I mean, I kill Jessica too. I don't like her, but I'd still rather kill Jacob. The eerie look of joy and excitement on Eliza's face didn't change one 
bit. Needless to say, the children's game dimmed to darkness at the awkward tension, but Tom himself was all the more disturbed. He could swear he felt a terror in everyone else in the room that heard Eliza speak. However, after that, it was a rather fun night. The rest of it had been relatively uneventful, just periods of wrestling and chasing, nearly knocking over some expensive items of Matthew's parents. One of the most notable parts was when Matthew's three-year-old cat, Leo, growled at the family dog, Ace, who was barking at everyone from the back porch. Leo ran upstairs, hissing numerous times when Ace made a beeline for the door, and that set off the laughing bombs in everyone's souls instantly. Even though all of them had an equal hindsight fear of Ace, the humor of Leo's hissy dash up the stairs was impossible to ignore. After a few more hours, Jacob called it a night for them all when Lily and Paul accidentally knocked a portrait down, slightly cracking the glass. Luckily, Matthew's parents were out for the night, though Lily and Jessica stayed up another thirty minutes later, making an effort to replace the broken glass in the portrait before his parents returned home. Tom woke up in the middle of the night to get a glass of water. Gazing at the surroundings of the kitchen as he walked in, he couldn't help but ironically marvel at Matthew's mum's collection of kitchen knives all neatly gathered in a knife block. Tom looked around a bit more, turning to gaze at the dining room before he heard footsteps coming from the kitchen. He turned around and started walking, and suddenly, he bumped into Eliza. They both jumped and Eliza ruthlessly laughed at the look on Tom's face. Tom was rather curious to why she was still awake, but Eliza cut him off, saying, do you know where Jessica is? Tom figured that Jessica might be in the garage working on the glass of the portrait, but once again Eliza cut him off, asking, Can you go have a look for me? I need to go to the bathroom, Dad. Understandably, Tom was bewildered to say the least, especially when he noticed that Eliza seemed to be gripping something behind her back with both her hands. As he and Eliza went separate ways, he went down the hall that led to the garage door and he continued to wonder why she acted so weirdly. His thoughts were cut short as he heard the faint but distinct sound of two sharp metal objects scraping together. He heard the scraping twice and it sounded like it came from upstairs, but there was another sound that caught his attention something that he made out to be a low groaning noise from the top of the stairs. Suddenly, he heard footsteps race across the kitchen and he jumped up in fear again. The footsteps were heading down the hall to Matthew's room. Understandably, he was a little fearful, child or adult who wouldn't be in that situation. But although he was young, he was smart enough to know that when it got late, your mind has a tendency to play tricks on you, and therefore he dismissed it as such. But then, once again, there was that familiar groan at the end of the stairs. And on top of that, Ace, the family's dog, was growling from outside the door. For his own reassurance, Tom chopped it up to Leo acting up again with the dog and therefore ignored the racing footsteps, now believing it just to be the cat. When he approached the garage, however, he noticed a sort of dark liquid coming from beneath the door. Now, Tom was a smart lad, granted, but he still was very young, and therefore, in his own childish logic, concluded that the garage had flooded somehow. And so, after immediately opening the door, he just wanted to help stop the flooding. As the door creaked open, Tom discovered the liquid to be a pool of blood surrounding the bodies of Jessica and Lily, who each had their own collection of stab wounds that decorated their lifeless corpses. Tom screamed in horror, and merely seconds later, he heard another metallic scrape. This time it came from the room where the boys were sleeping. 
Before he could even turn his head, the scrape was followed by a distant scream of Jacob coming from the same room. Ace's growling quickly turned into aggressive barking, and the chain he was being tied to was rattled violently from outside the back door. At first, Tom ran for Jacob, but after hearing footsteps coming from out of the room the horrifying sounds came from, he stopped dead in his tracks. He noticed that two of the filleting knives were now missing from the knife block in the kitchen. He came back to his senses and now decided that he should make a run for it to the front of the house. His only reason for not using the back door, purely and only being the dog, Ace, who by now has grown near rabid in his barking. But as Tom started dashing towards the front door, however, he had a good look outside through the front window. Matthew's parents' car was pulled in the driveway. This indicated that they were home. The car wasn't on by any means, and the footsteps from Matthew's room were getting closer. So with no time to spare, Tom started to run up the stairs to Matthew's parents' bedroom. He tripped on the last step, and his left shoulder was greeted by the wooden floor of the second story. When Tom opened his eyes again after his cringe of pain, he was downright paralyzed by fear. Right before him, another small puddle of blood that surrounded the carcass of Leo the cat, who let out one final groan of pain. Tom's paralysis was now inevitable with the combination of Ace's scratching at the door and fit of mad barking. Nevertheless, Tom pulled himself together. He got up, although weakly, and sat in shock for about a second, tears filling his eyes. He was getting ready to run and finish the path to Matthew Perrin's bedroom, but he never took off. From behind Tom, inches from his head, rang a sharp scrape of two knives together. Shh, Tom. It's just a bad dream. A harsh wind swirled across the barren plain. This was a desolate land, cold and rugged. Scrubby plants clung to the rocky soil. Millions of mosquitoes hovered in a semi-permanent cloud just above the horizon. At first glance, the land seemed devoid of animal life. But below the roots and rocks, a layer of permafrost held thousands of unusual creatures, entombed in ice. These extinct beasts were no longer a threat to humankind, their exotic ecosystem long gone. But they weren't alone in the frozen soil. Invisible to the naked eye, billions of bacteria and worms, viruses and fungi were also entombed in the ice. But not for long. The permafrost was melting. A jeep crossed the open plain. The driver searched for remnants of those lost creatures fossils or skeletons that he could carefully preserve back at the university in a controlled environment. The thaw was revealing a lot. He stopped to examine a pool of stagnant water. The outline of a tusk glimmered just under the surface. He struggled to pull it out from the mud intact. Mosquitoes buzzed incessantly around his face. The tusk wasn't the only prehistoric remnant in the pool. The water teemed with the revived bacteria and fungi unleashed from the melting soil. 
They became airborne as the man trudged the dry, flaky mud at the water's edge. Every breath filled his lungs with thousands of ancient microorganisms. Some of them carry diseases unknown to man. Till now. Pleased with his find, he loaded up and headed back. He had to hurry, you see. It would be around that time to pick up his daughter from school soon. As he drove across the plain and reached the dirt road, he started to cough. He lost his eyes at work. It sounded like a joke, two eyes walk in a bar like that. Living it was less funny, and more hours of hell. The steam pipe near his bench had popped on a bad weld, and everything above his nose was a single large third degree burn. Every day at 3 p.m., Two nurses would enter his hospital room and spray his rotting skin with high-pressure water, cleaning the area for, hopefully, fresh growth. Local anesthetic helped the pain, but not the sensation. There was no hope of recovering any eyesight, the doctor had told him. What was left was closer to moldy grapes than eyes, and sooner or later they would need to be removed to avoid infection. Right now, he was just too medically fragile for the surgery. So he lay in full darkness, listening to the wheezing groan of his roommate's CPAP machine and endless reruns of The Price is Right. Most of the time, he slept. When he couldn't sleep, he tried to summon his mother's faith, or his house, or his hands in his mind's eye, and wondering how long it would be to forget what all of them looked like. One night, when everything was quiet, he noticed how rich sounds were. A voice in the hallway sounded much closer. A tree tapped on the window, and he could count how many branches were hitting. Alone in the never quiet of the hospital, he thought about it. For the next week, he followed sounds. He would choose one as soon as he could separate it from its surroundings, and listened closely until it faded into the distance. A week after that, he began to notice a sound that was always close. No matter the time of day, the sound squelched and rolled around him. It was close, and when he tried to imagine what it might be, he could only picture the creature from the Black Lagoon looming over him. He asked the nurses a few times, but they didn't have anything for him but sympathetic noises and pain. His room was empty when he figured it out. The CPAP roommate had gone home two days ago and no one else had been brought in, leaving him even more quiet times to navigate. When he heard a voice in the hall, he rolled his eyes instinctively towards it, and heard the horrid sound again, heavy boots and thick mud inside his own head. Then, he knew. His molten eyes were even more of a burden now. His own body haunting him. Fortunately, one of the nurses carried scissors to cut the old bandages from his face, and she was as forgetful as he was blind. 
As soon as they left, while his face was still numb, he knew what he had to do. A saggy grape would pop easily, he thought, and then he would finally have some peace. It was Halloween, and all the children were outside dressed up and knocking excitedly on doors in hope of scoring some candy. Their parents were walking alongside them and keeping an eye out for them, in case something bad happened. There were all sorts of urban legends going around, even from when I was a kid. Stories of strange men kidnapping children when they knocked on their door, or the candy being laced with drugs or razor blades. Everyone had heard of these things, but no one actually knew anyone who had experienced them. Personally, I think it was just some government lies spread to make parents accompany their kids just so they wouldn't be able to play tricks such as egging houses or TPing their neighbors' yards. I was sitting at home with the curtains drawn and the porch lights turned off. I had no time or energy for some greedy rascals to knock on my door and ask for candy. I'd gotten myself a big bowl of discounted Halloween candy from the local supermarket, and there was already a big pile of wrappers forming on the ground beneath my feet. My favorite candy was Kit Kat. I loved pulling apart each finger and taking small bites to really savor the candy bar. Some people preferred taking a big bite out of all four of the fingers without breaking them apart first. I thought those were no better than animals. My mother had always been very strict with manners and etiquette, and she nitpicked even the smallest things, such as, of course, how I ate candy. I had to take small bites and eat with class, otherwise I was no better than the homeless people on the street. During the evening, Kit still came and knocked on my door and rang the doorbell. I wanted to open the door and scream at them. But I knew if I did that, the jig was up and they would know I was at home. Those little rascals do have their own little... Network of information, after all. I wanted a calm evening where I could watch the latest episode of my favorite soap opera. I had positioned myself on the couch with my feet on the table in front of me and a bowl of candy on my lap. I thought that if my mother had seen me right now, she would have had another heart attack and died again. But thank God that old hag was dead and I could do whatever I pleased. Just as I reached for the remote to increase the volume, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach. I tried to ignore it, but it kept getting worse. I put aside the bowl and stood up to get myself a glass of water from the kitchen. Suddenly, something splashed beneath me on the floor. Bloody hell, I yelled. This can't be happening, not right now, but I knew it was time. I put my shoes and jacket on and grabbed my keys and started heading to my car. The pain was intensifying, and I was wondering if I was even in any condition to drive. But still, I buckled myself in and put the gear into reverse and started driving. The night was cold and chilly, and it was thundering. I could barely see the road ahead since it was foggy too. Maybe if I was lucky... I would get hit by another car so I wouldn't make it to the hospital and escape all those bills I knew were going to pile up afterwards. But it seems luck was not on my side today, since I made it to the hospital and even found a parking spot right outside, which was highly unusual. Usually you would have to park all the way in the back and walk a good five minutes. Yes, well, tough luck if you were ill or injured. That's what I would think to myself every time I had to look for a spot. I walked in through the main entrance and made my way to the reception. 
Behind it was a young girl sitting on one of those spinning chairs with a pile of paperwork and signing away. I just stood in front of this girl hoping for her to notice me. The pains kept getting worse and I almost wanted to kneel over but I just held it in. It fascinated me how a person could be so unaware of their surroundings. I stood there for a good five minutes, just staring at her. I remember how psychologists back in the days used to think that humans had a biological instinct of knowing when someone was observing them, even if that person was not in their eyesight. I guess this didn't apply to this girl since five minutes had passed and she didn't even look up once. I could have kept us going for longer, but then yet another cramp hit me and I let out a wheeze of pain which finally caught her attention. She looked up at me like a deer in headlights and said, Oh God, I'm sorry, have you been standing here for long? Five minutes or so, I responded. Oh dear, I'm very sorry, I didn't see you at all. What can I help you with? Oh, that's interesting, I thought. I was standing just right in front of her and still she was so preoccupied with her work that she didn't notice me. What if I was a crazy gunman ready to shoot her? She really should start paying more attention to what goes on around her. I am in labor, I responded. The look on her face got even more embarrassed. She was almost grimacing. Holy damn, sorry, pardon my French. I'm just surprised you could stand here for five minutes without screaming. I'm going to call a nurse over right now. Please, have a seat in the wheelchair over there, and she will be here ASAP. The nurse rolled me over to the delivery room, and I laid in bed and the doctor checked how dilated I was. He said I wasn't dilated enough, and I needed to wait some more before we could start pushing. Once every hour he came back to check, and it still wasn't enough. The hours kept going by and eventually 20 hours had passed and this bastard of a kid was still not ready to leave. Because of this pregnancy, I had lost half of the hair on my head, two teeth and my once youthful and beautiful face was now bleak and riddled with acne. He had taken everything from me and now he wanted to stay there for longer. Finally the doctor came back and he told me that if he stayed in there for longer, it would be a danger to my health. Huh, a danger to my health? I'd never heard that one before. Wouldn't it be a danger to the baby's health to stay in the womb too long? We need to do a C-section immediately, he said. Wow, first he ruins my health and gives me a nightmarish pregnancy and then he decides to go out on a bang by forcing the doctors to cut me up to deliver him. If his father hadn't left me already, I'm quite sure he probably would have now if he saw the state I was in. The doctors rolled me into the operating room and laid me on top of the table. They injected me with nerve killer so I wouldn't feel anything during the surgery. Although it worked as promised and I didn't experience any pain, I could still feel everything they were doing. I could hear the sound of the scalpel cutting into my flesh and their hands gouging into the hole they had just created. I could feel their hands prodding inside and pushing my organs in different directions so they could deliver their baby. I finally knew what those alien abduction lunatics on TV were talking about. I felt like I had been abducted by aliens and being vivisected for their enjoyment. I barely felt human anymore. I felt like an animal in a slaughterhouse. They might as well just tear my heart out while they're at it since I felt dead already like I'd just died and went to hell. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, they pulled him out. I was listening for the sound of cries, but the room was dead silent. There were at least ten hospital staff standing around me, and they also were quiet. They just looked at each other nervously. The doctor quickly pulled him away from my line of sight and started working on him. I had no idea what he was doing, but one of the nurses came over and started stroking my head, told me not to worry and that everything was going to be okay. But what she didn't realize was that it wasn't in fact that he wasn't breathing that worried me. 
The doctor just stood there, dumbfounded, and had stopped working on the baby. He called over another doctor, and they started whispering to each other intensely. The possibilities of what they were whispering about were running through my head. He must have been born of horns, why else would they be so panicked? After a while, the doctor picked up the baby and walked over to me. Ma'am, in my twenty years of experience being an OBGYN, I have yet to witness a baby not to cry when they are born. I looked at him, and I was trying to wrap my head around what he just said. It shouldn't be medically possible, he continued. A baby must cry when they are born, because that's how they start breathing, but your son is perfectly healthy, and breathing even though he hasn't made a single sound since we delivered him. When I was back in my hospital bed, my son was cradled in my arms. The nurse had put him there, and I hadn't put him down. I was just staring at him. I knew the doctor had told me he was physically healthy, but there was still a part of me that felt that there was something wrong with him. Something mentally disturbed. What kind of baby causes their mother all this harm and then doesn't even cry when he is born? Like he is happy that he didn't have to endure any of the pain. He even got to take the easy way out and didn't have to fight his way out of me. On top of that, he was born on Halloween, the day where you celebrate all things demonic. I stayed up with him all night, just staring. Not once did he cry. I tried shaking him a little and even pinched him, but he just looked right back at me with a blank stare. The nurse came over and tried helping me to nurse him. I held him to my nipple and tried feeding him, but instead I screamed in pain. I pulled him away, and I saw my nipple was bleeding. The nurse looked back at me in shock and grabbed him from me. This twat was even born with teeth. I guess he's a biter, huh? She giggled. I wanted to slap that smile off her stupid face. One night, on his 13th birthday, he and I were watching TV. Every time we watched a movie together, it was a slasher, because that's the only type of movies he enjoyed. I had asked him once why he enjoyed seeing people get brutally murdered and the gore that followed. Hmm, I don't know. There's just something so satisfying about the way the blade sounds when it cuts through the flesh. I wonder how it would sound for real. The movies just use sound effects, so it doesn't really give a good representation of the real deal. The answer he gave me was even more horrifying than what was happening on the screen. So, you want to try it for yourself to see what it would sound like then? I responded. I don't think so. The cleanup would be too much of a hassle. I just turned my head back to the screen and tried to forget the disturbing things he just said, but that was easier said than done. That night, I laid in bed on my side and turned towards the window. It was a full moon, and the silver light shined into my bedroom and illuminated the whole room. Besides me, on the bedside table, was a picture of my son, smiling. I remember taking that picture on the last day of school. I had forced him to smile for the camera. You see, he never ever smiled at me. In his eleven years on this earth and I had yet to see even a corner of his mouth lift. He also had never cried or gotten angry. He was always deadpan like a robot or a zombie. I thought back to my C-section. I remember when I felt like I was being vivisected by aliens. What if it wasn't just a thought? What if it was a memory? Perhaps they put something into me before they closed me up. Something non-human, an alien fetus that looked like a human being. That was the only thing that could explain why he was the way that he was. 
I had been to countless psychologists, child behavior analysts, and doctors, but no one could find anything wrong with him. They always asked to speak with the child alone, and once they were back, they always gushed out about how well-behaved and intelligent he was. They told me I should appreciate my son since most of the mothers they saw coming in here dreamed of having a child like mine. They refused to listen when I told them that I believed that my son was going to become a dangerous man, a future school shooter, serial killer or something. But they always shut me down by telling me that he displayed none of the characteristics of those people. I told them about how I had read his diary and how he wrote that he fantasized different ways to kill people and how that would make him feel. He wrote about what weapons he would use and how he, he would go about doing it. The psychologist simply said that it was normal for children this age to have an active imagination and that it was healthy for him to journal his thoughts and feelings. I never told my son what all those meetings with the professionals were for, and he never asked. But I could tell that he knew exactly what they were for. I could tell by the way he looked at me. At age 18, he brought home a girl. He had had girlfriends previously, and this one, just like the girls before, had the exact same features. They all had brown hair and green eyes and the same general facial features. This disturbed me because they all resembled me. They looked just like me when I was their age. I know that he knew this because I would often catch him sitting in the living room, looking through old picture books of me and my teens. Every time he brought home a new girl, he would observe my reaction. He would look at my facial expression and body language for any type of clue that I was uncomfortable. But I knew what he was doing, and I refused to give him the satisfaction. Usually, they break up within a few months. When I asked him why he would break up with them, he will always reply that he got bored of them. He was just like his piece of crap father, even though he had never met him. However... With this newest girlfriend, he never got the chance of breaking up with her. One day, I was out on my daily walk and my next door neighbor hurried over to me from my yard, starting to give me condolences. I looked at her confused because I had no idea what she was referring to. Your son's girlfriend, haven't you heard? Well, what about his girlfriend? I asked. She killed herself last night. I thought he would have told you. My whole body filled with rage and I excused myself running back home. I walked towards his bedroom with rage almost pouring out of me and the thumbs of my steps echoed in the house. What the hell is wrong with you? Your girlfriend kills herself and you don't tell your own mother. You've been at home all day, you haven't even mentioned it. He just looked at me with that same deadpan expression he always had. I guess it's shock or whatever. He responded casually. I left his room and picked up the phone, calling her parents. We talked for a long time, and they told me that she had hung herself in their garage. She had left no suicide note, and they had no idea whatsoever that she was depressed. After I hung up, I just sat there. I recalled seeing a piece of rope in my son's room a couple of weeks ago, but today, it was no longer there. I knew for a fact that he killed her. I drove over to the police station and told them everything, from how he enjoyed watching slasher movies to the diary and finally to the rope. Tears were forming in my eyes and I hoped and prayed that they would believe me. But guess what? They didn't. They said that none of this was concrete evidence and that they had already investigated her death, finding no foul play. And what about the diary and the rope? I yelled. Oh, that's all circumstantial, he responded. From then on, I knew that no matter who I told, no one would believe me. My son was a straight-A student and an athlete at school. 
Right now, everyone felt sorry for him and were giving him heaps of condolences he didn't even deserve. I hated him. I truly did. There was not a single day that went by where I didn't wish I had just aborted him or killed him as an infant when I had that chance. What was most gut-wrenching was the fact that I was the only one who knew what kind of demon he truly was, and that he was the one that killed her. I just had to prove it to them. A month after the quote-unquote suicide of my son's girlfriend, he was back to normal. He was tired of the charade and decided to attend a party that had been thrown at his friend's house. Once he had left, I decided that this was my chance to prove to everyone what he was. I took my car I parked it a few houses away from where the party was thrown. I sat there for hours, just observing and waiting for my opportunity to strike. I could see a girl stumbling out through the doors and started walking towards my direction. She was visibly inebriated. Once she reached my car... I cranked down the window and asked if she wanted a lift, which she accepted. She got into the passenger side of the car and I started driving. She was so intoxicated that she passed out immediately. I kept driving and eventually I stopped the car. I then got out and walked towards the trunk of my car, pulling out a pair of gloves and putting them on my hands. Then I pulled my hair into a tight bun and made my way over to the passenger side of the car opening the door. I dragged her out of the car and started making my way into the forest where I had parked. I made sure not to go too far in, since I wanted her to be found relatively quick. I placed her on the damp leaves on the ground and pulled out a knife from my back pocket. This knife belonged to my son, and he had bought it online at an auction after seeing Pulp Fiction. He was dead dead set on getting this specific knife since it was a replica of the one they used in the movie. I looked at the girl and thought that she was perfect. Brunette with green eyes, just how he liked them. A part of me felt bad about what I was about to do, but I kept reminding myself that this was for the greater good. She was in fact a hero because she was giving her life to save the numerous other women who could face the same demise at the hands of my son. I think she would understand somehow and be grateful to be remembered as a hero. With the knife in hand, I plunged it into her chest. The sound it made was ear-grating, but I knew I had to keep going. I wanted to make it as quick and painless as possible for her, she let out a loud moan, but she was so out of it that she didn't even try to defend herself. Thank God the syringe I injected into her in the car worked. I kept plunging the knife into her over and over again and the blood splattered all over me. Finally, when I was done, I left the knife in her chest and retrieved a piece of tape from my pocket. On it, I had my son's fingerprints. I had placed these tapes on his door handle, you see. Because, let's be honest, that is a thing you touch almost on a daily basis, and so does he. I placed the tape strategically on the knife handle so that his fingerprints would be easily identifiable. I got back to my car and opened up the trunk again. I picked up the bottle of bleach and started scrubbing down the whole passenger side so that no one would be able to find any trace of her in the car. When I was done... I looked back at her body one last time, and I felt proud of my masterpiece. I knew I had done something good tonight, even if it meant that she had to be sacrificed for it. But what was one life in comparison to the countless other possible ones? I knew I had no other choice but to do this. I had tried talking, reasoning, and convincing other people, but nobody listened. They made me do this. They wanted this. This is the result of their inaction. That night was the best night's sleep I had ever gotten. 
The feeling of finally accomplishing something and soon hopefully being rid of my psychopath son was so liberating. The only unbearable part was having to wait for him to get caught, but when I finally heard those bangs on the door, followed by the words, Police open up! It was unlike any feeling I had ever felt before. It was pure bliss, euphoria. The fact I had finally found the body and connected it to my son felt like a thousand orgasms at once. When they hauled him away in handcuffs, he looked at me, but this time, not with that same deadpan expression he always had. No, no, this time, it was anger, disgust, and horror all at once. Seeing all those feelings splattered on his face gave me immense joy. When nobody was looking at me, I gave him a satisfied smirk. I finally won. I finally won this little cat and mouse we were playing, and I had finally beaten him. He had finally got caught in a mousetrap, and I just stood there in the doorway, letting out a sigh of relief. It felt like the world had been lifted off my shoulders and I was finally free for the first time in my life. I had been a prisoner for 18 excruciating years, and it was finally time for him to feel what I had felt all this time. I lost my job last year, and things have been tight. My wife works, so we've been relying on her wage. I took over cooking and housework things, as I am home all day now. I'm looking for work, but fast food places don't seem to want people my age. Some days, it all feels quite... Desperate and out of control. I do quite well with the budgeting for most bills, but I've had to do a lot of stretching on food now that our new and lower income barely well, passes the month. Lots of cheap pasta dishes and buying up veggies on special offer that need to be cooked immediately. A lot of protein is totally out of reach just from the price point of view. Cheap cuts I can sometimes manage if it's near the best before date again, again selling at a special offer, but those go fast in our local supermarket. Even food banks have mostly passed out canned foods. There are a lot of people in our situation it seems. We really aren't as healthy as we used to be either. Recently though, We've been doing better. My wife came home last week with ground meat, so I prepped a ton of dishes and froze them. And this week, she got kidneys for a pie. I'm not unappreciative, but I just don't know how she's affording at all. Her job at the mortuary really doesn't pay that well. I loved attention. I craved for it. The feeling of fleeting glances or long stares on me made me ecstatic. I peeked through high school and college, made a whole lot of friends who I still kept in contact with. I hold weekly brunch parties with them in my lovely two-story house. Three years later, 
and everyone is getting married or having kids. The weekly brunch parties still occur with the <laughs> occasional drama. Take last week for example. Jenny came and said that her child had gone missing. He was an easy target. A small handful of candies and he would follow anyone, anywhere. I advised her to lodge a police report and let them handle it. Spoiler alert, he was never found. As I am tucked in bed, I whisper a small good night to the jars lined up on my shelf. They look so adorable just floating there, all round and well preserved. I feel so safe when they watch me as I sleep. Six jars containing six pair of eyes belonging to the bodies that were rotting in my basement. I love attention, crave for it, bask in it. So, eyes on me. They always came at night, the terrible and inhumane things that haunted me for years and years. I can't even call them creatures because I never knew if they were physical beings or not. These, these horrors came only after the sunset and the darkness of the night had blanketed the world with its false serenity. Nothing was serene about the night when these malicious apparitions came to me. I can only speculate where they came from and what they are. In my mind, they seem like a product of prayer, a healing prayer meant to improve the health of my grandmother in her childhood days. She's told me about a time when she was an orphan in the western Ukraine after the Great Patriotic War when her leg started atrophying for no apparent reason and no doctor could actually help her. She spent months losing the function of her legs until an elderly woman came to visit the orphanage and found my grandma with her decaying legs. And grandma said she can vaguely recall seeing this woman standing over her, chanting, praying. After that, grandmother's legs miraculously healed. I don't rule out the possibility of some extraordinary thing happening here. Maybe this woman was a faith healer, maybe she was a witch doctor of some sort, and maybe she was handling forces that were far beyond her control. We'll never know for sure. Maybe because Grandma regained her legs, something had to be taken as payment. My health and my sanity. Judging by my family's history, it's probably not only me. An uncle of mine became increasingly volatile before having a huge argument with the family and so left the house. Unfortunately, he ended up involved in the 90s Russian oligarch gang affairs and had his life cut short. Another aunt died relatively young due to alcoholism, even though she was by all means nothing like that like one would imagine an alcoholic to be, I mean. My... My cousin is having weird health issues. It causes her to faint every now and then, without any detectable cause. And I, well... I was being visited by grotesque fiends for years at night, starting out maybe when I was around five, I think. As long as I remember... They'd show up at night, 
horrible and inhuman, ugly, disgusting and visually torturous. They were insectoid kind of things, they were just ghastly amorphous shadows and they were humanoid things too. A pale, thin thing without a face and absurdly long arms with almost cartoonishly long claws. I could even see a reflection of myself with my mouth sewn shut. Creatures themselves had mouths gaping on its palms, filled with piranha-like teeth. There was an ostrich-like monstrosity with four hooves and an elongated human face. Some of those things looked like mutated animals, others like completely alien things. The worst one of all was a vaguely anthropomorphic entity walking on all fours, almost like an ape but with an awkward gait. Its joints clicked and cracked as it crawled towards me, emanating a terrible stench of pus mixed with wet dirt as it stalked around. The thing was completely nude, aside from the occasional tuft of hair jutting out from the muscular frame. Its most uncanny feature, however, was its face. The thing was reversed upside down, its mouth was on its forehead, a hairy set of lips containing a single bloodshot, soul-piercing eye, and its eyelids were above its crooked chin, perpetually closed until it was about to feed, revealing needle-like teeth under each eyelid and long, prehensible forked tongues. Every time these things came to me, they came to feed on something inside of me. As a little boy, I would freeze up at the sight of something shifting and maneuvering in the dark until it revealed its horrific face to me. I thought the fear alone paralyzed me, but in actuality it was something else, something I figured out when I was a teenager. These things, they are like vampiric parasites. They would latch on to me with their feeding organ and fill me with a paralyzing agent to keep me still as they fed on me. Every single time they'd suck this something out of me, leaving me exhausted and in pain the morning after. Specifically leaving my bones aching and riddling my skin with the feeling of pins and needles at the sight of the bite without leaving physical marks behind. Seems like these things leave nothing physical behind, nothing that can be seen under the light of the sun. Naturally. I tried telling my parents about the things that haunted me at night, but they reassured me these were just nightmares or night terrors. I wish they were nightmares, but they weren't because on many nights during which I wasn't being attacked, I suffer from nightmares about these hellish things. We talked about sleep paralysis too, but it wasn't that. And I tried to protest, they just dismissed it as a wild imagination. I didn't know that vivid imagination and sleep paralysis left behind traces of brain-melting bone aches in a child. By the time the pain noticeably crippled me, I guess it, it was too late. Inflammation was burning its way through my spine. It turned out. The spinal column was already in an early stage of fusing and contorting itself. I was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis. But that didn't explain the pain in my arms and legs, nor did it explain the awful nightly battles I was having time and time again, either with these tormenting beings or with my own body. Many nights I had cried myself to sleep just from the unbearable pain. It had gotten so bad that even taking a deep breath was becoming painful and something inside of me seemed to have snapped overnight. The childlike, existential dread of these things had turned into a burning, passionate hatred, fueled by the vicious joy bringing relief of adrenaline carried on the wings of my stress-induced agitation, turned into an outright boiling anger. Some time after my diagnosis, I had decided enough was enough. At the same time, the concept of evening was being stretched into later and later hours of the day. I had started seeing these things before I was even in bed. I could see them lurking at the periphery of my vision, stalking the unlit rooms of the house, salivating their neurotoxin as they waited for me to head to bed. Figuring I had to at least try and defend myself from these things, or else I might end up dead or worse, a vegetable. That's why I finally chose to fight back. Throwing fist proved effective against one or two of these night stalkers, but they have adapted as well. 
Those that usually came alone stopped coming alone. Instead, they started arriving in packs, consistently. At that point, punching and kicking didn't suffice, and I ended up getting overwhelmed with my body becoming the banquet of alien hyena-like swarms. The mornings after were pure, ephritic agony. It ruined my sleep, and my awful mood sapped the strength out of me and the will to live a normal, active life. My condition even worsened as the days wore on, and I found myself in a deeper abyss of bone-breaking pain. At the time, I hit my lowest point. I was becoming increasingly anxious about everything and slowly turned agoraphobic. The stress was killing me, and my eternal fury was reverting to its original state. I was becoming afraid of those things again. I was becoming afraid of every movement and noise and sensation gliding across my skin. My entirety was being consumed by fear. At some point, I began feeling as if, as if each move I made, physically and metaphorically, resulted in a burning hot nail being inserted into my skin. And that, that led to my mind turning in on itself. Dysphemia came first, followed by a full-blown depression. Suicide ideation came about later. I never really planned about killing myself. I just kept... Well, I guess I kept romanticizing the idea of dying just to escape all of this pain in my head over and over again. Eating became an issue, moving became an issue, and leaving the house became an issue. Everything was falling apart around me, and only the night stalkers remained. I've gained a new friend in the form of the occasional bowel inflammation. These things destroyed everything for a large chunk of my life, but then, in a strange twist of fate, they were also the key to fixing most of my problems. They were winning, battle after battle, but this led to my victory in our war. One evening, I was making coffee in the kitchen while my parents were out of town, and there was a power outage. The house went immediately dark, and my mind went dark with it. Instead of freezing, probably because of my horrible sleep schedule and the constant mental strain of the never-ending stress and pain, my brain just went into an overload. An eerie, cold sensation washed over me as the pain disappeared into the void of the darkness. Clarity grazed me for the first time in a long, long while, right before I felt something touching the back of my neck. With a swiftness I couldn't even imagine myself having, I turned and swung my mug wildly. I hit something solid. The sound of shattered ceramic tore through the silence, followed by a terrible shriek that rocked the entire house. Somehow, I don't even know how, as if one of the same horrors haunting me possessed my body, I kept swinging the jagged shard still connected to the handle of my now-destroyed mug. The sound of soft thumps sounded almost melodic to me at that moment, and eventually, whatever I was hitting fell down. Before I knew it, the fluorescent light had washed the kitchen anew in a white shimmer, revealing my handiwork. A bloodied chimera of avian and serpentine features was prone beneath my feet, unmoving, still dead. Pulsating waves of blood raced through my body, leaving a strange after-feeling all over. Before long, the pain returned, followed by the realization of what had just happened. I had just killed one of these monstrosities. Dread, mixed with excitement, swirled in my mind as I understood the ramification of my actions here. Both of those feelings because I could finally prove the beings were real and because I killed a presumably living creature, leaving its corpse in my parents' kitchen. Come morning... None of that mattered. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, nothing remained of the thing by the time dawn arrived. It just evaporated like it never existed. It left nothing behind. A pile of ceramic shards on the floor and a coffee stain. No blood, no flesh, no corpse, nothing. Only pain. Lots of pain. 
My body was beyond sore that morning. My body was in shambles, but at least I knew. I knew I could stop these things from hurting me further. I could finally end their reign of terror over my life. And so, I finally fought back. Now properly armed, keeping a knife under my pillow just in case. For years I've fought these things off, killing many of them. I've ended up knee and elbow deep in monster blood, and yet they still keep coming, again and again. Somehow, even those I've butchered and dismembered return. They were almost taunting me as they came back, after each time I killed them, just to do it again and again, as if trying to prove the point that my efforts were ultimately futile. Even if it seemed so, they weren't really futile. My condition had gotten better because these things could no longer feed on me anymore, and fighting so frequently had improved my overall feeling. The depression was gone, and I found a new joy in life. Each morning proved to be a new challenge, granted, a new mountain of incorporeal corpses to overcome. I fell in love with my violent routine, even though it made things with people rather complicated sometimes. It's off-putting to have a knife under your bed, especially when you live in a decent and quiet part of town. I've never really bothered telling anyone about the fiends. It's not like most people would believe me anyway. And it's not like my joy would last forever. Life is a struggle after all. It is pain. And it is agony. One day, they just stopped coming. Just like that. The hordes of parasitic ghouls were nowhere in sight. Gradually, then suddenly, they just faded out of existence. Maybe... Maybe they were never even here. Maybe I was just imagining them after all. I never found proof of their existence, and there never was any proof of their existence anywhere else. My condition is an actual disease, fully diagnosable and somewhat manageable, not to mention that my awful mental state is the way as it is because of my disease. I am a deeply disturbed man who is the son of an anxious and ridiculously superstitious, to the point of mild supernatural paranoia, mother, who has a medical issue that we have no real concrete explanation for. That said, I doubt these things weren't real. They had to be real. I could see them. I could feel them. I could fear them. And now, they're gone. I never imagined I'd miss the torment, but here I am, clearly losing my mind over the fact that I'm not suffocating on a mouth full of dread. I am losing sleep because there's nothing lurking in the shadows, and over the fact that I'm completely and utterly alone unbothered and undisturbed, stressing over the ghastly silence and the oppressive emotional void that comes from a not-so-sudden lack of constant stimulation. Hemingway has this classic moment in The Sun Also Rises when someone asks Mike Campbell how he went bankrupt. All he can say is, gradually, then suddenly. That's how the silence drives you insane, especially after living years and years inside a storm of noise and chaos. You wake up one day, and it's silent. It's weird, but it's a welcome change. Then you wake up the next day, and it's still silent. And on the third day, it's silent still. By the end of the week, you are suspicious because it's still silent, and it's never been silent and you're thinking of all these thoughts. Is this for real? Is this a trap? But it remains silent. Before long, before you even realize it, you're resentful of the silence and then you've become afraid of the silence and you can do nothing to end it. I, I just want something to go wrong for one night, but nothing ever does and it hurts. It really bloody hurts because I've destroyed my life, my brain, I've destroyed everything to get over the pain and the chaos and now it's gone but the mental agony still pulsates in my spine crippling me for days on end and there's nothing I can do about these mental wounds. Nothing I can do to make them stop 
stinging and bleeding now that nothing but a cold grey silence remains. When I was a kid, my folks intimidated me into my best behavior with a boogeyman called Babai. He was supposed to look like an old, twisted man with a cane and a sack that would take me away if I misbehaved. Now, what made this little disciplinary measure very much effective? was the fact that the creature was based on a homeless person in our neighborhood. A very creepy homeless person. We called him the Old Man. He was a short but stocky geezer, dressed in rags, white strands of hair poked through his hood. He was missing a bunch of his teeth and one of his eyes was completely wall-eyed making him look like a chameleon. He carried his sack everywhere he went, and no one ever knew what he had in there. This man was what my nightmares were made of. See, when I was seven, I came face to face, well, eye to eye, with the old man. Woke up to get a glass of water in the middle of the night, and as I headed back to bed, I glimpsed at a figure standing by the window. Curious, I looked a little closer. And I guess he noticed me too. He shifted his gaze to me, and those fucked up eyes. Man, I pissed myself. I still remember the face of a hell-spawned ghoul staring back at me, all grey and wrinkled, missing teeth, random strands of hair, a malevolent shine in those misaligned eyes. One locked onto me as her smile widened, revealing a jigsaw of gums and yellow teeth, and the other staring at something somewhere. That face, that face haunted me for years to come. He was harmless, as far as I know. But I've heard rumors of him, well, masturbating on street corners and whatnot, but I've seen nothing like that myself. No one ever complained about him doing anything either, but if he had an eerie presence looking like a zombie during the day. Imagine what he looked like at that moment. In a child's mind, he was death personified. I kept myself as far as I could from that man for years. I dreaded an encounter with the old man. As silly as it is, he became my real-life babai, the boogeyman. Until I grew up and stopped believing in ghosts and monsters, that is. I moved out and started my own family. Years later, when my father celebrated his 60th birthday and I came back to my childhood home, I came face to face with my boogeyman again. Once the party was over and everyone went to bed, I of course stayed awake. My head swept away in nostalgia, mentally reliving my childhood as I smoked my cigarette. Something moving in the dark brought on some less than pleasant memories. See, my parents live on the corner of the street, right by the road. And it's not the best illuminated part of the street as well. Across from their house stands this ancient oak tree, absolutely magnificent, 
and as I was sitting there, smoking my cigarette, I saw a shadow of a person creeping up towards that tree. A familiar silhouette, short and stocky, with a stick and a sack dragged behind it. The old man. I don't even know what on earth I was thinking. I probably wasn't thinking. In an act of alcohol fueled bravado, putting out my cigarette, I walked outside onto the porch. For whatever reason, I felt like I had to confront my boogeyman. So I stood there on the porch, waiting for the silhouette to get any closer. To do something, maybe say something. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was just standing there, eyes locked on that shadow in front of me. It probably locked its gaze on me too, and we stood there along with time. Just standing and staring like reflections of one another. The sudden appearance of two bright orbs tearing across the night cut my drunken giddiness short. A loud thunderclap and a sickening pop followed. The shattering of glass and a moment of deafening tinnitus ringing like a sonic ghost in my ears. Lights began illuminating the interiors of houses around me and people started running outside. There was a lot of screaming and panicking, but I just stood there, letting it all sink in. The flashing lights darted across space. The noise of an engine tearing through the nocturnal silence, the screeching of tires against the unforgiving concrete, and the metal behemoth flying uncontrollably through the darkness. By the time I finally processed that split second, in all of which a huge body of metal flew at an insane speed and compressed itself against a tree, dissecting a person in the process and turning half their body into a finely ground paste, the police and ambulances were all over the street. I didn't really pay attention to what happened throughout the night. I was too busy trying to digest the moment in which I had seen a person become, well, spray painted on metal and wood. Needless to say, it was a sleepless night, filled with unpleasant numbness and alertness at the same time. It all happened too fast to be processed, and yet slowly enough to pick apart every detail. A night filled with nothing less but brain fog. Come morning, everything died down again, no pun intended. Three people had died that night, and I vaguely listened to the details of their identities, still dealing with the mental image of a lethal collision stewing in my brain. After all, you don't get to see that kind of thing every day. After the departure of the last police cars, I grabbed yet another smoke and walked out onto the porch again, getting lost in my thoughts yet again. My gaze shifted to the wet grass in my parents' yard. A patch of cloth peeking through the grass caught my eye. It wasn't there last night, that's for sure. I walked towards the cloth only to realize it was the old man's sack. It must have flown all the way across the road when he got pulverized. I didn't want that thing in my parents' yard, so hell-bent on getting rid of the sack, I picked it up by one of its edges and pulled it off the ground. I wish I'd grabbed it in any other way. Because once the sack left the ground, I nearly pissed myself once again. My eyes met the old man's, one of his glossy eyes fixated on mine, while the other stared into dead space. His decapitated head 
laying at my feet. It started off a harmless vice, a feeling I enjoyed when I heard of the misfortune of others. Later, I learned that it is a common, widespread emotion, well, widespread enough that the Germans came up with a name for it. I lead a blameless life otherwise, I do not drink in excess. I do not smoke or partake of any other drugs other than coffee, which I drink two cups of every morning so I may fulfill my work duties efficiently. I am absolutely not abusive to my long-term partner. I pay taxes and I enjoy, at least I thought, all the usual pleasures expected for someone in <laughs> my station in life. But soon enough I realized this feeling my vice. It gave me a deep, visceral thrill unlike anything else. Watching the new episode of our favorite Netflix show just paled in comparison. I could feel it. A wave of deep joy rising through my veins as someone started going on about their divorce? Death of their granny, a cancer diagnosis, or something as trivial as their son dropping out of school. The more the upset, the deeper the joy. A moistness blossoms between my legs unlike anything I have ever felt in my wildest adventures, which are pretty tame, I know. I lean forward, barely able to compose my features in the suitable arrangement of concern warranted for these exchanges. Yes, tell me more. Fortunately, there is hardly a shortness of misery and misfortune, and I'm able to get my fix fairly regularly. Indeed, I have a reputation for being a good listener, for kindness and compassion. Colleagues, neighbors, friends and relatives know I am always there for them, ready, even eager to listen to their trials. One colleague locked in a year-long feud of a construction company who destroyed their house gave me a regular update. Another spared me no detail of their ghastly divorce dragging through family court. And aside, do judges actually behave like that? My god, I have no idea until Lindsay opened up to me about it. I leapt up every instant of mistreatment of Alex's father at the nursing home and when the young son of a neighbor fell to his untimely death from their balcony, my body and mind were transported to a state of indescribable ecstasy. Now, that last event, now that left me wanting more. Ah yes, the downfall of every addictive vice. More, more, more. It is no longer enough to be a passive recipient of other people's suffering. It is not enough to hear about disasters through the news. That just leaves me cold and dry. I thirst for the immediate spectacle of human distress. The quivering voice, the agonized face. And so, I have begun <clears throat> facilitating misery. 
using my local knowledge to create yet more suffering. Darlene's husband cheating? Easy! Paul lost his job? Child's play! But I still crave more. Tonight, I am planning a little hidden run for a neighbor's daughter, quite a stellar student too, as she returns from basketball practice. That should fix me for another ten days at least.